Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all today to the Geoscience Australia Wednesday seminar. Um, my name is Brendan Brook. I'm a marine and coastal geoscientist here at Geoscience Australia. And um, I'll be the chair for today's meeting, filling in for uh, Chris Nelson, who's uh, on leave. Um, to start off with, uh, I'd like to um, uh, provide an acknowledgement of country. So Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia. And we, acknowledging, we acknowledge their continuing connection to land, waters and communities. Uh, we pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. Okay, so today we're very privileged to have Professor Andrew Short from the University of Sydney and his presentation is entitled Australian Beach Systems, Are They at Risk from Climate Change? Uh, a very uh, um, uh, topical um, uh, topic to, uh, to be looking at. Um, without going into any more detail, because I know Andrew, <laughs> Andrew's going to touch on this, um, he will be referring to the International Panel on Climate Change, uh, the sixth assessment report um, <coughs> that talked a lot about uh, beach erosion in Australia. Um, and about uh, Professor Short, so uh, Andrew Short has degrees from the University of Sydney, University of Hawaii and Louisiana State University and has worked and published on coasts from the tropics to polar regions, including all of the Australian and Brazilian coastlines. So his main interest is in the physical nature, dynamics and quaternary evolution of coasts and the likely impacts of coastal change. So Andy's been researching this you know, for several decades. He's published 16 books, uh, most of which are related to the Australian Coast and Beach Morphodynamics and numerous publications, so hundreds of journal papers. And um, yeah, I'd just like to acknowledge that um, Andy's work has informed the marine and coastal geoscience uh, research that we've been doing at Geoscience Australia for many years. So he's got a lot of seminal papers and, uh, and reference books. So while he... Um, he remains active in research and publication. He's an honorary professor in the School of Geosciences at the University of Sydney. So please join me in welcoming Professor Short to the podium. Right, uh, th thank you, Brennan. And um, also to Chris, who's not here, who originally invited me. Um, Thanks for everyone leaving your desk, dragging yourself away to come and listen. So it's going to happen to our beaches. Uh, as uh, Brendan said, I've, I've had the good fortune of working right around the Australian coast. I've managed to see every beach on the coast and, and, write, and write about them all as well. So I have, a, I have a fairly good sort of first-hand knowledge of the coast. And so what I'll be talking about today is based on that knowledge, plus also a number of publications both for and against our beaches, I guess, um, including a lot of work done here, right here in, in GA. So, um, so that's what, uh, so the, the aim is this, what, what, not so much are about risks from climate change, because climate change will certainly impact our beaches eventually, but what, what level of risk is there now and what, what's the level of risk going into the future? So if you look at the, if you see the media, you see all these photos, the Womberall Beach, Collaroy there, Kingscliff, you see these dramatic images often in the papers, uh, picking after major wave events, and often they are so, they, uh, they, the uh, captions are in, uh, suggesting that it's all due to climate change. Um, all these sites here uh, are where houses are located and have been for 100 years on the beach. So when the beach uh, erodes, not recedes, erodes, it of course damages the properties. It has been doing it for more than 100 years at all these locations. Kingscliff down the bottom is due to headland bypassing again the uh, property is being encroached onto the beach, not the beach encroaching onto the property. Onto the property. So we see these things and a, a lot of people are wondering, well, what, what's actually happening? 
And the reason why he's here, you know, I was so keen to might be wondering what the future of our beaches uh, might be. Uh, will they have any surf or any beach to walk across to get to the surf? So what I'm going to do uh, in the next little while is, first of all, look at uh, just, just uh, what, what's ahead of our beaches. Briefly on the nature of our beaches, because we need to know what they're like if we're going to understand how they behave. I'll then look at the IPCC um, assessment six um, of both global and particularly Australian beaches, what they had to say in March this year, just a few months ago. Um, and then I'll turn to what's, we're actually, what's actually happening on our beaches from field work and from satellite, based on field studies and also on uh, satellite studies of the, of the beaches and finally come to some conclusions. So first of all, just briefly, what are, what are our beaches like? There's a lot of them, there's over 10,000 of them. Uh, mainland beaches, there's another thousand or so on the islands. They occupy about half of our open coast. So they're a major national resource, they're a major part of our national boundary. Half of it is sand uh, exposed to waves and uh, subject to change. The remainder of the coast, of course, is predominantly rocky. And they range considerably in type, from wave dominated in the south to tide dominated in the north, and they're responding continuously to wave and tide conditions. So they're both dynamic and also vulnerable to any changes in these processes or sediment budgets. Okay, so they range from, you've got the wave dominated, particularly around southern Australia, about half of our beaches are wave dominated, very energetic, like the southern New South Wales coast, about 60% of tide modified, particularly in northern Australia, and about 30% of tide dominated, also predominantly in northern Australia. And we have about 4% fronted by our coral, fringing coral reefs or rock reefs um, around the coast. So there's tremendous variation in the nature of our beach systems, not only in their nature, but in the type of sediment that composes them. Now, they're normally composed either of quartz or, uh, or silica or carbonate detritus derived from the shelf or seagrass meadows. And not only you can see predominantly in the east, it's, uh, it's, it's quartz dominated, in the south and west, it's dominated by carbonate material. Um, half the Australian beaches, uh, the sediment comes, is generated in the near shore, in, in the shelf and near shore, um, which is another potential impact of climate change on carbonate production, which I won't go into today, but that's something else which needs a careful consideration. And of course, they can range in size from fine sand to medium to quite coarse material. So there's a lot of uh, different ingredients that go into making up our beaches. And then uh, they have, there's a lot of geological control. The average beach is only 1.4 kilometres long, bordered by headlands, rocks, reefs. Um, there are three, however, up to 200 kilometres in length. <laughs> and their boundaries in terms of sediment transport. I gave a talk here a few years ago on the coastal sediment department. Yes, sand can move along the coast from shore sand transport. They may be close to sediment transport, they may be leaky where sand can seep around the headland, they may be open where sand continues to move longshore along the coast, um, which has a big impact on the sediment budget of, these, of beach systems. And historically, as it's pre-climate change, they may be eroding, they may be stable, or they may be in accreting. Um, beach erosion or beach recession is nothing new, there's a good proportion of the coast that has been receding for centuries, if not millennium, for good reasons. So all this implies that our beaches are highly variable both regionally and even locally. Beaches, adjoining beaches can behave quite differently uh, depending on their, their, their conditions, their, their length and boundaries, their exposure to wave and tides, sediment composition and size, sources, budget, long-term behaviour. Now, if we're going to model how beaches behave, we need to take all of these into account. Okay, all these factors have to be taken into account. And I stress that because uh, this is something that um, some of our European colleagues have not been doing. If we then jump to the uh, International Panel on Climate Change, uh, the, the uh, assessment six that came out in March this year, uh, the sixth assessment report, um, if you read the coastal section on that, they placed a, a high confidence in general recession of most Australian beaches by 2100. Quite startling 
um, uh, assessment. These, their assessment was largely based on really a couple of uh, uh, papers that uh, again generated in Europe. This one, mainly Dutch uh, modelers uh, in 2018, and they mapped the, the world's coast using an algorithm to detect shorelines and, uh, uh, over time. And based on that, they said 24% of the world's coast was eroding at greater than 50 centimetres a year. And Australia had the worst record of all. <coughs> the highest globally, on average, right around our coast, we're eroding at uh, minus 20 centimetres per year. That little map here shows some hot spots um, here and there. Uh, this was the first one to come out that indicated that the, the entire Australian coast, on average, was eroding. Uh, quite a, a dramatic statement. This was followed up two years later by this paper, uh, Sandy Coastlines Under Threat of Erosion. Well, here they really mean recession, not erosion. Again, a bunch of mainly European modelers, coastal modelers, and they, they, they went the total length of the sandy beaches, projecting lost by 2100, is considered Australia emerges as the most affected country on the globe, with at least 12,000 kilometres of shoreline threatened by erosion to 40 per cent of the total sandy coastline. And they projected a beach recession of between 50 and 80 metres by 2050, in the next 30 years, and 100 metres by 2100. Now these are very startling and quite uh, dramatic statements, and they got a lot of media attention at the time, both in the scientific media and in the uh, press media. Um, and uh, there were a number of us who were concerned, those of us, particularly field scientists, who are down at the beach most days seeing what's going on and have a better idea. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, the, um, their models were based, put very simply, in using a modified Brun rule. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Brun rule, it, it, it at sea level rises, it predicts sand will be taken offshore from the beach and deposited to maintain a leak equilibrium profile. Um, and based on a data set using beach slopes of a space of a kilometre. And overall, you can see it already, they indicate that most of the beaches are going to be eroding by 2100. And in Australia, the blue is erosion. Uh, most of the beaches there will be eroding by 2100. They've been very dramatic and quite startling images and projections. So if this is the case, the Australian beaches are at extreme risk and some publications have gone as far as to say they'll become extinct. It wasn't a good word they, they used, they've since apologised for using that term, they should have used something else, but it wasn't a good word, but <laughs> it certainly caught the attention of the, of the media. Um, it would also mean thousands of beach owned properties are also at risk. So in response to that, uh, a group of us led by Andrew Cooper over in Ireland, um, uh, put in a, a, a called a matters arising to nature climate change, uh, basically saying that the underlying false premises of, of Oscus and Al is linked to the inappropriate use of this very simplistic Brun rule and applying it globally. Um, the Brun rule promotes offshore sediment transport. We all know wave energy promotes onshore transport. Um, and uh, Whilst offshore transport might happen in very steep slopes, in most cases, as sea level rises, the sand's going to move shoreward and maintain the beach if it is retreating landward. It will be maintained. So, rather than relying on global modelling, which uses, uh, takes a global approach it's at various spatial locations, some of which might incorporate a number of beaches, um, and using a fairly simplistic Brun rule uh, and a range of sea level scenarios to predict what's going on around the globe. Uh, we thought, uh, I thought it was better to look at what's actually been happening around the Australian coast and what's likely to happen in, in, the, in the coming decades, in the likely future, in an era of not just rising sea level, that's just one of the factors. We have, we have changing wave climate, we perhaps, we perhaps uh, there's suggestions we're seeing it already. Increasing storm intensity. Uh, the 2016 storm uh, has been suggested as an indication of 
the type of storms we might get more of in the future. In other words, an intense storm coming out of the northeast. And also, I won't get into the tides will be modified as, as the change of configuration of a shelf and shorelines of tides will also be modified. But I will briefly mention the, those other ones, the impact of sea level, wave climate and storm intensity. We'll start at my old favourite, the Arabian Beach. Um, one of the world's, uh, I started the surveys here back in 76, they're still ongoing. The U New South Wales, University of New South Wales group continues the, the, the surveys by using high tech technology nowadays. Um, Narrabeen is a site of infamous swimming pool going into the, onto the beach uh, in 2016. Um, so it's a, it's a well, well studied beach, well publicised, gets a lot of media attention whenever there's storms in Sydney. So uh, when this was eroded back here, it still didn't get that to where the 74 storms got to in 16. There has to be worse, worse erosion than that. In fact, the first houses went into the, into the sea here back in 1920. And then in 1940, six houses went in. Uh, in, the, in the 50s, there was damage there. It's been, they, they, uh, the only thing that changes here, instead of having beach shacks, they build bigger and bigger and bigger houses <laughs> to go into the sea. <laughs> and they want the government to come and bail them out. Anyway, that's what's been happening. Okay, so uh, what, what's, what, what's actually been happening? This, this spaghetti diagram, one of these, there's, there's eight survey points. This is 76 to 2020, and it's indicating the variation in the shoreline and in the volume along the beach, at different points along the beach. I'll just put that up here to show you there's quite extreme variation, and the shoreline can oscillate and rotate as much as 100 metres on a regular basis. So quite, quite extreme, it's a very, very dynamic beach system. If we average all those out, uh, while there's an often massive shift in sea volume up to 700,000 cubic metres in response to the 2016 storms, the sand volume in 2020 was essentially the same as in 1976. The beach is very dynamic, but the sand volume over that 40 year plus year period um, has remained stable. And that erosion you see is due to the houses encroaching onto the beach, not the beach eroding into the houses. This is also confirmed. I'll, get, I'll talk more about the, the, your, uh, the Digital Earth Australia data later, but just um, I'm sure you're all aware of the, the, this program here. And this, um, but it shows you that um, based on this point here, Devon Street, over between 88 and uh, 21, the coastline has remained net, net stable since 1988, using another a data set. And uh, another one has come out more recently, COSAT, which is a joint project of the US Geological Survey and the University of New South Wales, led by you know, Kelly and Boss. Um, they, they have just mapped the uh, southeast coast of Australia, done a similar type of mapping, and they projected, they did the trend in the shoreline based on uh, from 84 to 2020. Uh, for now, we actually have it being uh, slight, slightly accretive, sort of stable to slightly accretion. You see this white line running down there, indicating again uh, from a different data source or um, a, a different approach that the, the beach has remained stable. Um, and just yesterday, my son, who's lived his whole life on our red beach and surfs out here most days, he keeps phoning and saying, Dad, the beach is so wide, what's happening? <laughs> Oh, why is it so wide? And it's, it, this is the widest the northern end of the beach has ever been in living memory. Now, I just put this up. It, it, uh, it doesn't prove the beach is accreting. It just proves that this beach, which in 2016 had the dramatic photos of houses and swimming pools falling into the sea, has recovered fully. And this, this uh, accretion here is due to be present on any other end causing rotations of an oil, a very strong rotation of an oil. And um, all the beaches I'm familiar with that experience rotation have had very strong northerly rotation. This is a response to our climate indices, the Southern Oscillation Index, not due to um, generating low southerly waves for a long period of time and no major storm waves. So Narrabeen is the widest it's ever been and the locals are freaking out because the surf's not too good. <laughs> um, another beach which I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard about, Benjello, uh, previously called Maria by Bruce Tom, uh, down, uh, down at uh, Browley there. 
Um, it, it's been uh, surveyed by Roger McLean and Bruce Tom and others since 1972. You can see, it's, again, it's like now being a very dynamic beach. Uh, it experienced the 1974 storms, extreme erosion right back into the four dunes. And um, again here, if we look at these two uh, summary data sets, the coast set has a, a, a creeping slightly. And the middle of Australia also has it a creeping slightly uh, since 1972 and 1988. And then if we go to hot off the press, you may, have some, you may have seen this paper that just came out uh, by, uh, by Roger McLean, Bruce Tom, Joshua Soon and Tom Oliver. Uh, so reviewing the 50 years of survey data from 1972 to 2022, <coughs> at the end of the survey period, there was more sand in the beach and forging system um, compared to when they started back in 72. They also found no clear link between the silver rise over that period of two to four centimetres a year and uh, the behaviour of the beach. And as I said, it's a very dynamic beach. It's, it's subject to average 15 storm events a year. And it tends to recover from these storms within uh, four to eight months. Very similar to Narrabeen Beach. And very similar to uh, mainly most of the exposed dynamic southeast Australian beach systems. I've always said that the most resilient beaches will be the highest energy ones. The least resilient ones are going to be the, lo the lower energy systems. Okay, let's change to New South Wales, go over to South Australia, where um, uh, Tom Oliver and others uh, did a very nice study of the progradation of the beach over the last five and a half thousand years. We've prograded up 7.7 uh, metre per year, slowing down more recently, the past 1800, about 0.3 of a metre per year. And then if we go to the Digital Earth Australia data, an average big change in shoreline position over the whole beach uh, comes out at um, a mean uh, accretion of 0.44 metres per year, which is very close to the uh, 0.33 based on the um, dating. So again, a, a, another location, a, a moderate energy beach, but it's um, it got closed set of the cell, there's net zero loss and has supply of relic and modern shell carbonate coming in from the seabed and near shore in front of it. That's all the good news. Now that's some bad news, some beaches are eroding of course. If we go to the longest beach in Australia, what I call the Coorong, going from you know, up in Victor or Middleton, you've got Murray Mouth there, the mighty Murray, right down to Cape Jaffa down the bottom there, 220 kilometres in length. Um, this uh, beach uh, has two major sources of sand loss. One in the Murray Mouth flood tide delta, because that mouth migrates backwards and forwards, and as it does, more sand is deposited into the uh, entrance there. And also, a lot of sand being lost in the dunes. Uh, Patrick Hesp is working down there for his uh, colleagues at the moment, and there's a lot of dune activity going on down there, and lots of sand into the dunes at the moment. So there's a uh, and if you go diving offshore of the Coorong, what you find, once you get out for about 15 minutes, is it's all hard substrate, either mud or, or reef. There's no sand out there. Um, so there's a finite source of sand which is being lost on, on shore. And so as you might expect, um, the, uh, the, uh, it, it may be retrieved. In 2009, I was asked by the South Australian government to uh, work, assess if the Coorong barrier could be breached so the ocean could enter the Turong, Kurong Lagoon, which is hypersaline. I uh, worried about that. And they asked us to, uh, myself and colleague Peter Cowell, we did some modelling using Peter's shore face translation model based on a considerable amount of field data, I might, I might add. Um, and we pr pr the probability over 100 years of the shoreline could recede up to 38 metres. is 99%. There's a very small probability it could retreat up to 265 metres. Given that the barrier averages about over a kilometre in width, there was no possibility, even at 99% of the barrier being breached, which made them happy. Now we compare that to 
to Digital Earth Australia data. Uh, you can see some parts are accreting, some parts are eroding. It's a very long and highly variable beach, this one. It goes from very high energy to almost zero energy down the bottom. Um, in fact, the, all, all this here, these erosion hotspots here are due to migrating sand waves, not to... Um, and uh, if we then look at the average of all those points along the beach and average them out, we find that there's a net retreat of 0.27 metre per year, which would equal 27 metres by 2100, which comes in around where we projected a 99% probability of erosion or recession on that order. So we're quite happy with this. Our model, the modelling seemed to be reasonable. So both the modelling and the field data seem to be pointing in the same order of magnitude of beach recession. So there are certainly are beaches receding like that. There's one more receding beach, another long one, 90 mile beach in Victoria. Uh, it's been eroding for, for many years, probably centuries, probably millennium. And we know that because you've got the longshore transport, <coughs> we've got down the southern end here, we have the girdle peaks exposed, and we have all the sand accumulating and the northeast there in the, mount, in the Cape Al sand dunes, the massive sand dunes up there, and off there, off the coast there, where that circle is, is um, uh, Gable Island. There's a massive shelf sand body around Gable Island, where sand has been deposited over the past few millennium. Some of it also sneaks around the corner and goes up to Disaster Bay. So, um, so there has been this ongoing long, uh, sediment deficit in sediment budget due to longshore transport, um, ending up in those locations. Now, in all these examples I've shown so far, sea level has not played a role in any of them, either the accretion or, in this case, erosion. Erosion was, was going on pre-climate pre change. Um, another thing I, I just, one slide I'll mention, um, there is a, a, a suggestion that um, with changing climate, we're gonna get more intense cyclones off the coast, tropical east coast cyclones. Um, which will be very damaging to the southeast Australian beaches. Um, uh, Mitch Harley and Bird Nasling and some others uh, just last year published this paper and based on three beaches, the of course Narrabeen Beach in Australia, here in Porth in, um, in Wales, not Cornwall and one in Mexico, uh, no, there's none in France, uh, they found that following, this is based on field studies of these beaches pre and post storm, but um, following major storm events, the beaches recovered to a greater ex extent than pre-storm. And uh, what they're suggesting is that these extreme events may be mobilising sand from water depths that weren't previously accessible and transporting that sand shoreward. Um, and if this is the case, this, this it may result in a net input of sand into the system, which may help delay the impacts of rising sea level. Now, this is just based on three beaches, but it's an interesting hypothesis, but, the, but more intense storms will result in net, if the sand is available offshore, result in net onshore transport and a positive input to the sediment budget. Um, so, it, it, of course, depends on sand being available offshore for that to occur. The other thing that um, with climate change is bringing is changing wave climates. And this just shows you, this is just to show you that uh, based on Yoga's work, the uh, global wave, 10% of the time, this is how big the waves are globally. And the highest waves in the world, of course, occur down south in the rest of Australia, down here, year round. Um, the next slide is going to focus in on southeast Australia. Uh, the, whole range of, the whole range of wave climates, of course, around the world, but we'll just look at the one, uh, the local one. This is the work of uh, Goodwin, Mortlock and others. Uh, well, first of all, on the left-hand side here, you can see, if you make up that little yellow line, go up the coast, that indicates the longshore. Oh, God, I'll put that on you, my phone. Phone keeps ringing. Um, the... Uh, the yellow line indicates for longshore sediment transport that begins around Cape Hawke, continues all the way to Fraser Island and beyond on the, down on continental shore. 
I'm sure you're all familiar with that. And um, along the way, it, it bypasses headlands and does all sorts of funny things. And because some of the beaches uh, and in this section of coast, particularly up the, um, oh, the northern end, there's a number of beaches that have been eroding for probably centuries, if not millennium, eroding right back into the Pleistocene barrier system. So uh, this, this uh, transport system is critical to the, uh, the uh, I guess, the behaviour of, uh, of beaches in northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland. And of course, you're all familiar with the Gold Coast, which is topped up with uh, bypassing, dredging, and so on, and sand nourishment. Um, and the erosion continues. Fraser Island, of course, is eroding right along the beaches there. So it's a very critical uh, transport system in southeast Australia. Now, uh, uh, Woodman and others suggest that the uh, subtropical ridge is going to shift about two and a half degrees south, which is going to move all the uh, pressure systems, particular cyclonic systems. Uh, the easterly trough low, the southern Tasman low, and the what they call southern secondary lows, is going to move them south as well, which is going to cause a rotation in the wave climate of southeast Australia. It's going to result in a counterclockwise rotation of wave climate. This will cause a decrease in the rate of normally sediment transport and also a beach rotation to the south. Now this is going to impact every beach along the northern New South Wales coast, central northern New South Wales coast, south east Queensland, because it's going to modify the amount of sand moving along the beaches. Maybe for the better, maybe for the worse, it remains, remains to be seen. So just a summary of what they're saying, that you're going to get a more easterly wave direction. Our predominant wave direction on the east coast is southerly. So more easterly direction, slow down the amount of northerly sand transport. They're predicting an increase in winter wave energy, decrease in summer. The beaches are realigning anti-clockwise, in other words, rotation to the south. Southern ends are creating, northern ends are receding. Uh, it'll disrupt and decrease normally longshore transport by 30-40% and has ramifications for northern New South Wales and South East Queensland beaches that lie on the sand. So the point I'm making here is that there are other things besides climate change that are, are impacting and going to impact our beaches. Sleeve will just being one of them, but um, storm intensity, wave climates, uh, and this already wave climate has a big that massive width of Narrabeen Beach, that slide I showed you, is due to a, um, a rotation to the north, due to the present on Enio conditions. Okay, now I'll come back to, I mentioned earlier, I'll, I'll get back to Digital Earth Australia. Uh, this Your colleagues here uh, published this paper uh, two years ago, um, uh, which uh, basically maps, I'm sure you're familiar with maps the, using satellite imagery, maps the uh, position of a shoreline on average year by year around the Australian coast from 1988 to 2020, 20, 2019. And uh, it's been a, a tremendous um, eye opener into what's really what's actually been happening around the coast. I've given you a few examples before from Narrabeen and Jello, you know, the Coorong and so on. This just shows you what's happening around the entire coast. Um, that just shows you some of the uh, uh, recessional, uh, where the colour-coded uh, behaviour of the coast, whether it's receding, stable or accreting. This next slide shows a little better. Um, uh, into six regions, the northeast, the Gulf of Carpentaria, northeast here, southeast, the southern coast and the west coast, uh, broken up into regions and the next table uh, gives you the uh, behaviour of each of these regions. and. These ones on the right just show you some beaches that are eroding. And the critical thing in this table is that if we look at the, uh, on a continental scale across all of Australia, the last 30 plus years, 66% of the beaches have been stable, just over 20% are retreating, and a bit over 12% are actually eroding, are growing. So if we had the stable and the, and the accretionary ones, that comes up to what about um, uh, nearly or 70, nearly 80% nearly of the beaches are either stable or accreting. Now to me, this is at odds with what we're seeing coming out of the modelling and the uh, IPCC projections, which are to, if they are to be true, if we're going to get 50 metres of recession, 
in the next 30 years, the beaches are better get moving very soon. Because um, uh, even at rates like this, at, um, uh, at a, a few, a few uh, half a metre a year, it's going to take more than 50 years to retreat that far. So what we're actually seeing happening is, is at odds with what has been predicted or projected by the some modelling modellers coming out of Europe and also taken up and then used in the IPCC projections. So and to summarise uh, what the, your, your data shows here, most of the state coasts remain stable. The high energy southern coast is the most stable at 69%. 30% are creating at greater than five metres a year, half metre a year, 20% are eroding. The highest recession rates in Western Australia. <coughs> so, what's all this mean? <laughs> okay, we know that sea level has risen 25 centimetres since 1980, 12 centimetres in the last um, not too many years, since, 19, uh, since the 1970s. So it is, it is rising, there's no doubt about that, and it, 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 it's a suggestion that it may even be accelerating. Uh, that's a, the $64 question, is how much, uh, it, if it is going to accelerate, by how much? And so there's, a, as you all know, there's a huge range of projections as to where sea level may end up by the uh, end of the century. Um, that red line, that's where we are now, and that red line is about on another 25 centimetres, which we've had for the last sort of roughly 100 years within most of these projections here. Um, so we, we don't know, we, we'll have to wait and see as to which ones um, are true. But the thing is, sea level is definitely rising, no doubt about it, it is rising. And wave climates appear to be changing and storm intensity <coughs> appears to be increasing. So all these things are happening. So what can we say about it? What is it going to do to our beaches? So in conclusion, the, first of all, the simplistic Global modelling, which is incorporated into the IPC ARC6, is not providing robust predictions of beach response to sea level rise, particularly for Australia. And we know we've had 25 centimetres rise since 1880, and it, it, it's a, a, insufficient in Australia to trigger general beach recession. As you've just seen, your own data here from the DEA, most of the beaches are stable and a few are even accreting. And those that are receding, the 20% are receding, I would say most of those have been receding pre-climate change uh, due to uh, deficiencies in sediment budget, like Northern New South Wales, um, uh, like 90 Mile Beach, like the Coorong, like Dutton Way in Victoria. All these, you can name all the hotspots around Australia which have been receding for many, many, many years due to, uh, due to de sediment budget deficiencies. Um, so during the last... 30 to 50 years, most beaches have remained stable. Those are receding, we're doing pre sea level rise. The beaches are responding rapidly to storm events, very rapidly, and to then so driven changes in wave climate, you know, due to beach rotation with uh, La Nina and uh, El Nino. Um, so, sea level rise is just one of a range of factors which will determine the future of our beaches. We also need to consider the sediment sources and budgets. And this is critical because it's, it's ultimately the sediment budget that determines the behaviour of the beach. Even if sea level rising, if you have a positive sediment budget, the, the beach can remain stable or even accrete. Um, and um, the, uh, like Gooch and Bay, that example I showed you, it's continuing to accrete because it has a positive sediment budget. Um, the uh, Benjello, which I also showed you, has accreted slightly, although we're not, uh, I don't think Roger or Bruce are suggesting um, it's a, it's a, it, it's, uh, they're saying it, it's stable at the moment. They're not really saying it's, it's progressed, continue to progress, although it may be. Um, the, uh, we need to also look at the impact of changing wave climate on the storm intensity and direction, because these are going to, particularly if we get changes in the direction, like the 2016 storm came out more out of the northeast had a huge impact on the southern end of a lot of beaches because of a slightly different direction, as well as the height of the waves. Uh, it's going to realign the beaches. If it's a permanent change in wave climate, the beaches will realign. Whether they erode, whether they have a, a road or not, the beaches may realign. 
Um, and also, as I said, it's going to impact longshore sediment transport in South East Australia, right along the South East Australian coast up the Fraser Island. So rather than relying on global modelling, we need to undertake studies at a regional and local or sediment compartment level to more accurately predict uh, the future uh, of each behaviour. And this is what's embedded, the sediment compartment approach has been embedded in the New South Wales uh, coastal uh, program of the, OE, uh, the state government. All coastal management plans now have to be based on a sediment compartment approach uh, in New South Wales at least, uh, also in Western Australia. And uh, now wild beaches have proven resilient to the 25 centimetres rise, a trigger causing more ride spread recession should be reached in the coming decades. The big question mark is when, you know. <laughs> how fast is silver going to rise and when are we going to reach that trigger? And how will we tell? Not all beaches are going to behave the same. As you said already, they, they, they behave differently. Erosion, accretion, stability. They're going to behave differently in the future. Um, so we need uh, the, the sort of monitoring that the DEA is doing um, is going to help us, uh, I guess, uh, highlight when these subtle changes start to take place. Um, how many decades? I don't know. I think it's going to be a few decades at least before we see any significant changes or general recession occurring. So, just the final slide, the, the exposed high energy southern Australian beaches seem to be the most resilient, shown by Narrabeen, Vangelo and the DEA data. <coughs> Fortunately, whilst we see lovely photos in the paper of houses threatened and falling into the sea, the vast majority of Australian beaches have no name, they often can't get access, they're undeveloped and they have plenty of room to move and migrate when the time comes. So most of the Australian coast we won't even, we won't do anything about. that, we'll just let it you know, go, behave, go on, it'll only be those developed sections which are going to get all the attention. The most at-risk beaches are those with a deficient sediment budget already, there's plenty of those, um, and developed shorelines they're going to need to defence like they've done at that very ugly seawall at Collaroy. <laughs> uh, they're going to hear out the Gold Coast pumping sand in, sand on from near shore. Or in the good old US and they have the community that says expert house mover. They just jack the houses up and move them inland if it's somewhere to put them. Uh, there is one surf club in Australia that has, uh, is on skids so it can be moved at Lennox Head, but unfortunately there's nowhere to move it to. <laughs> anyway, um, that, that's all the future. So um, that's all I'm going to say. I'll leave a nice photo of my local beach and Maria Heads uh, during the 2016 storms. Thank you. Thank you.